Okay, so um, I always start off with, um, oh, no, come on, it won't, pro oh, there we are, it wasn't progressing to the next screen. Uh, I always start off with a bit of optimism, and I'm hoping that soon we'll be, I'll be able to come back to Bolton to, to find that, uh, but I think probably the best, most optimistic thing I've seen uh, of late uh, is, um, is what's going on in the rest of Greater Manchester, because what grad GM uh, on the 22nd of April did um, a tour of the infrastructure in three different uh, districts um, and it was possible to put together a round trip uh, all on uh, on good quality cycle and walking infrastructure. It was mostly, it was a, it was a cycling tour, so it was mostly looking at the cycle infrastructure, uh, but We'll see a little bit later that, that that walking is also addressed by these. There's a video of that, if anybody's interested. It's only a couple of minutes long, uh, which was done by Harry Gray, just showing the sorts of things that they looked at. So I think that that was uh, that was really nice to see. And it's showing that things, you know, the, the year of delivery was actually last year, um, or maybe even the year before. But now we're actually seeing some delivery happening. Um, some interesting research and data, um, the, um, the cycling uh, traffic index for England was was um, was released a few days ago, um, and that's a little bit optimistic. Um, if you look at this, is based on 158 cycling sensors based in various places around the country. Not a lot, but it's um, it's indicative because we it's it's showing how the, the change compared to the baseline, which is December 2013, uh, and also 8,000 manual traffic counts um, that were conducted uh, in the year. And um, uh, the document is there. Um, you can click on that link when you've got the slide. The slideshow is up on the um, on the Google Drive, and you can see obviously there was a, a huge increase in um, in cycling uh, due to the um, to the COVID uh, crisis when the roads were very pleasant and lots of families were out there uh, cycling on uh, traffic free roads. But and it's dropped now, but it's not dropped back to the level that it was at before. So it's somewhat higher than it was before the COVID uh, crisis, and it's quite a lot higher than it was um, in 2013. So that's the national picture. But I think we always have to be cautious about that because that's quite a long period. That's 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 a decade, and in a decade, it's not a huge increase. Uh, if you look at Vienna, which is a, a statistic that's come out uh, in the last few days as well. Um, the most recent one being 2023, um, the, they've actually doubled the amount of cycling in Vienna since 2018. And that's because they've put they've done a lot of road space reallocation and put some um, some good quality cycling, a lot of good quality cycling infrastructure in there. What they're saying now is that there are concerns that what they've put in isn't big enough and they might have to make it wider. Um, now, I've predicted before that that's what might have to happen in Bolton at some point. But, um, but anyway, it's, uh, it's interesting to see what can be achieved if, um, if there's the real commitment. Um, the next bit is uh, pretty bad news, really, in a sense, because uh, it's the active travel funding cut, which um, uh, I wondered whether the TFGM report would mention it. I guess if, um, if Joanne was here, it might have done. Um, but the um, in the 2021 spending review, the government pledged £210 million uh, in the period from then to 2025 uh, for active travel uh, infrastructure. Um, only £230 million has been spent so far, uh, but in the March spending review, it was stated that from now till the end of 2025, uh, only £100 million more will be spent on that. Now, that represents a £380 million cut. It's um, It's half of the money that was pledged has, has got more than half the money that was pledged has gone. Um, now, just to put it into context, it just happened in the same announcement, which was primarily about the um, um, the rail project, the, the big, uh, what's it called? Uh, the big super rail project anyway. Um, he also mentioned that to date, we have spent over 800 million on planning, only planning, the Lower Thames crossing, so one project. So that puts into context how much £710 million is. It's not very much at all. Now, that's resulted in a whole lot of uh, toing and froing on social media and in uh, in Parliament, and uh, in particular, Pauline Latham uh, asked in Commons 
um, asked the Secretary of State for Transport to actually to, to justify the spending this, of this massive amount of money on active travel schemes and in particular on cycling schemes. And the reply from the Under Secretary of State for Transport was uh, all about what fantastic value for money spending on active travel is. Um, that um, that um, it delivers a huge number of benefits across a whole load of areas, mental and physical health benefits, of course, the active life side, improvements to the quality of journeys made, benefits associated with mode shift from mode vehicles, like improved air quality, reduced congestion, all of that sort of thing. And we know that active travel covers so many different, uh, different bases. Um, he also mentioned that uh, it, cover, it supports the uh, decarbonisation strategy. Uh, by switch by mo because of mode switch, um, and also pointed out. Then he said that that for the for active travel fund four, it's been estimated that there's um, about a two hundred and forty percent return on investment. That's actually quite a pessimistic uh, in, um, return on investment compared to a lot of other ones. And I think typically we're looking at five point five or five hundred and fifty percent return on investment. Um, and he's also talked about behaviour change interventions. So the, the question that's being asked is, if you're saying all of that, which is a fantastic return on investment, surely it is not a good idea to, um, uh, to cut something like that at a time of, uh, of difficulty. Um, in the House of Commons, there was um, a discussion about, which was actually about the parking, pavement parking, um, stuff which we've talked about a few times over the last couple of years um, but in during that um, Richard Holden again the same um, uh, Secretary of State uh, said that they have an ambitious vision to have half of all journeys in towns and cities either walked or cycled by 2030 that's the the vision the the target that I've mentioned a few times in relation to uh, gear change the net zero and a whole lot of other things um, and that uh, the Active Travel England was, was set up to, um, to make that happen. And so Ruth Cadbury replied, well, in that case, uh, why the heck have you cut the budget by two thirds? And um, it was a rather waffly answer. And he keeps talking about um, uh, about two billion pounds of investment uh, that's going into um, uh, to Active Travel during this period. Um, well, I don't I'm not sure that that's the case. And Sustrans don't either. And so what Sustrans have done is they've had a, a very intense campaign now about this uh, to try and, and reverse it. And they're producing some very interesting and quite alarming statistics here. If you look at the, the left picture there, uh, Scotland is spending £25 per head per year on active travel. Uh, Wales is a bit behind them on £19 per head. Uh, England is now spending £1 per head. And if you look at the spend on active travel, when compared to all other transport spend, it's a minuscule fraction of this, not 0.08% of the transport budget is going into active travel. So that actually is, is, is it's, it's, it's something to be ashamed of if, uh, if you're in, in government. And so Sustrans have got this campaign with all sorts of, um, uh, of um, they're attacking this from all sorts of directions. Um, meeting the targets that have been set, air quality targets and so on. Um, the UK domestic greenhouse gas emissions, so net zero and all of that. Well, it's uh, they're, they're saying they're never going to uh, achieve the net zero um, targets if um, given the amount of um, carbon emissions that come from transport uh, and the importance of active travel in, uh, in achieving those net zero uh, aspirations. Um, and there are some quotes from uh, from individuals. So you know, this 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 there's a it's a really good campaign that's going on, and I think it's deliberate that everything here is put in black and white, uh, rather than colour with some red bits on, uh, because it's showing how how dire the situation is. Um, personally, uh, I think given the proportion of the transport budget that's all that was actually earmarked for spending on active travel which is virtually nothing the cut is probably not that uh, a serious concern because um, 50 percent of virtually nothing is virtually nothing so uh, so it probably doesn't make much difference and there's a lot more needs to be done and i think that's a lot of that is about bringing uh, active travel spending into the mainstream not treating it as an add-on 
Okay, backslash and litigation, that was the next thing. Um, we had some bad news on the Kensington High Street uh, case, which we've been sort of tracking for the last couple of years. Um, the judicial review was actually dismissed. Um, when you read the judgment, um, certainly when I read the judgment, I actually agree with the judgment on the grounds that, um, that were put forward. And it's worth just spending a, a little bit of time. It's actually worth reading the full judgment, which is uh, you can get uh, at that link in the slideshow. Uh, but there were two remaining grounds. Originally, there were five grounds um, brought by the, uh, the plaintiffs in this, uh, this calling for this judicial review. That was reduced to two because some were disallowed uh, at various stages along the legal process. But the first ground was around the duty to consult, basically, and to consult adequately. Um, and the ground was based on basically a common law duty to consult. It wasn't based on... Um, a, a, an express duty to consult, a, a statutory duty. And the judgment actually uh, raised that. It said, actually, there's no statutory duty to consult. Um, and so the case hasn't really been um, uh, satisfactorily established that uh, a duty to consult was, uh, was violated. Uh, and also uh, the, the inadequacy of the process that was carried out in, um, in uh, Kensington and Chelsea uh, was not demonstrated by the plaintiffs. The second ground was to do with irrationality, and that's basically um, where you say uh, that the, the council or the authority hasn't acted properly because they have come to a, a decision that is perverse given the ev evidence that's available. Um, and um, so that was one of the aspects. Part of that was about the fact that the council had reframed the decision because the decision that they'd taken was to remove a temporary, um, an emergency uh, active travel infrastructure implementation. And the way that they framed the, co the, 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 the reconsultation that they were ordered to, 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 um, to conduct on that was that the consultation was on putting active travel infrastructure in where it doesn't already exist. Now, you can see why that's, um, that's an argument. But in fact, that was not considered by the uh, by the judge to be um, uh, to be a material consideration in this. And then the final one was lack of consideration of cyclist safety. And so the judgment um, came out against the, the plaintiffs on that. Now, a lot of people were quite disappointed by this. But when I once I'd read the judgment itself, I felt a bit more positive because the key point here is that the decision that Kensington and Chelsea made was taken before the DFT amend, amended its statutory guidance on active travel infrastructure. And what happened has happened since is that the guidance now places a statutory duty on authorities to prove that there is a case for removing even temporary facilities before removing them and to do that through clear evidence and consultation and there's a lot of guidance on what constitutes good evidence and how consultations must be uh, be carried out so i think if that decision in kensington and chelsea had been made uh, after the amendment of the uh, the dft statutory guidance the it might have been a very different story probably would have been a very different story because the main basis which was the lack of a common duty to consult is now gone because there is uh, the lack of a statutory duty con to consult rather uh, has gone now because there is now a statutory duty to consult. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens after that. Um, the other one that we were looking at was the pool keyhole bridge and there's nothing new to report on that, um, that we're just waiting for that to go through the, um, through the legal, um, legal procedures. Now, I thought we, we've uh, at various times during the uh, the last few years, we've looked at what some things that other councillors councils are doing um, because we might be able to learn from them. Uh, and I want to pick up two things. One is um, is actually in Stretford. It's in Greater Manchester, but it's not a Greater Manchester um, authority thing. Um, except in the sense that the funding was provided. Now, this is Chester Road in Stretford, um, as it stood on April in April 2021. Now, it happens that in 2022, last year, it was resurfaced. And in that resurfacing, um, the, the uh, cycle lane on the right, which was an advisory cycle lane with a dashed line, was widened slightly and changed to a mandatory cycle lane. 
And the, the cycle lane on the other side was widened a bit, but it remained an advisory cycle lane because they retained parking um, along it. Now, um, it just so happened that uh, just after the Google car went through uh, Chester Road in, in Stratford on, in October 2022, um, a consultation kicked off on a proposed scheme for Chester Road, um, a proposed active travel scheme. And I just want to pick up some of the things that were in the proposals and then look a little bit at the consultation and how that went. So the proposal was for segregated cycle lanes in both directions. So now not just paint, but some means of separating. And it would actually be light segregation because this is a 30 mile an hour road. So light segregation is acceptable on that. Uh, by black traffic separator posts, which are ones in fact, without any orcas. Um, they said no less than 1.5 meters wide. And uh, it's interesting to have a look at what they ended, where they ended up with that. The second one I think is very, is very, um, uh, important and revealing. The removal of existing the existing central hatched road markings and all the marked right turn facilities along the impacted route. Now that's something that um, uh, some councils, including Bolton, are resisting, um, very much resisting. And certainly on Chorley New Road, one of the complaints that people had about the scheme that was, uh, was being put in there was that right turns were difficult because there wasn't enough space in the right turn uh, pocket. Well, what they've done on Chester Road is removed the right turn pocket and removed all that central hatching, something we've called for in a lot of our um, uh, reviews of schemes uh, in the past. Um, second one, the next one, the third one, introduction of two proposed controlled zebra crossings um, and removal of the uncontrolled pedestrian crossing points along the route. So the, the uncontrolled ones are like we have on, for example, Chorley New Road and lots of other places in Bolton, Manchester Road as well. Um, they were a, a, a ref, pedestrian refuge in the middle and a couple of drop curbs on either side. Uh, and then the pedestrians just have to um, take their chances. Uh, they've removed those, and, uh, or the proposal was to remove those and put two uh, zebra crossings in, in their place. Um, so that's the uh, three and four. Five, they proposed that two current on-street parking bays, which you could see in the picture that I showed uh, on the previous slide, uh, were to be moved laterally so that they were half on the footway and half on the carriageway. Now, we'll come back to that one because uh, when you look at the consultation it's interesting to see what happened there. Uh, dedicated right turn lane um, onto the uh, Bridgewater Way junction approach, that's a major junction and so um, they were maintaining that but they were shortening that dedicated right turn lane again to make space for the, um, uh, for the active travel facilities. And then finally the removal of uh, temporary traffic management including traffic uh, cones along the A56. Now the A56 was a very contentious scheme. It was um, a COVID emergency active travel scheme that involved putting one dockers um, and it was extremely successful. There were lots and lots of people using it and then the council took it out. Um, and if in a sense the Chester Road scheme is intended to be an alternative to the Bridgewater Way scheme. And there are some arguments in the consultation uh, about why that's a good, uh, a good thing. But the, 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 another good aspect of this is that it does link into um, facilities that have now been implemented down Trafford Road in, uh, in Salford. Okay, so the central hatching, that's the sort of thing that we're, we're talking about. Um, central hatching, right, that's a right turn pocket for this road that's just to our left here. Um, and there were these awful advisory cycle lanes, which we can see all over the place anyway. Um, what that looks like now, that was actually changed in 2022 when the road was, um, was, was resurfaced. And in fact, that particular bit of hatching had already been, uh, been removed then. Um, but what it was, looks like in the proposals, those pictures are taken from almost exactly the same point. Um, so that was what the proposal was, to, to go from that in 2021, to, to that. Um, and you can see the zebra crossing there that's been added. Um, you can see uh, that the lanes have been widened here um, at the expense of traffic within the traffic lanes and the, or the ones are, um, are along there. Now there's a lot of arguments about whether ones are adequate anyway, but on, I, I think on a 30 mile an hour road, if the lanes are wide enough, 
uh, which those seem to be that's that's pretty good and then the other visualization that was uh, was included there was uh, the what this one which had the unprotected advisory cycle lane through the door zone of the parked cars which were now blocking half of the pavement uh, and so that was obviously a, a bone of contention uh, there incidentally that building on the right is the venos factory where they used to make the venos cough medicine um, it's not in use now so what happened in the consultation well the consultation ran last november to december end of november beginning of december the key issues were these the 50 50 parking everybody objected to it um and i do wonder whether it was a deliberate um uh act to to put that there because pedestrians cyclists everybody was going to object to that and that main, means you've got quite a high uh, figure of number of people objecting to it lots uh, a number of people object to cycle lanes and their impact in general it's a waste of money don't agree with the wider scheme of having these uh, these uh, damn active travel facilities at all um, not enough people cycling there to justify putting these facilities in you know the usual thing well of course there isn't because it's so hostile um and then there were a lot of people who said they would prefer full cycle lane segregation so not just ones but um, but proper curbs um they also said it, there was a, an overall question in the consultation which was what do you think of the scheme overall and nearly 52 percent said they opposed the scheme but it was quite good in the consultation report that the ambiguity in that was recognized and uh, so uh, unlike um, the statements that 68% of people were against the scheme in some way, which is what we saw on, uh, on Chorley New Road, this ambiguity was, was recognised. Now, that consultation report is, is well worth reading just to see the sorts of things uh, that are in there, because uh, the response to the consultation um, contained some pretty robust responses to the issues that were raised. So the 50-50 on-street parking bays were eventually removed, not immediately, but uh, uh, they were eventually removed from the scheme entirely. And that meant that all the on-street parking was removed entirely. So that's important to, uh, to think about. Just because there are people want to park there doesn't mean uh, that should trump active travel uh, facilities. The, all the general opposition uh, stuff was dismissed it's a waste of money hardly any recycles here those were answered um, very robustly and uh, there's a little bit of that on that, that bit i've only taken a little bit of the, uh, the designer's response so and various inadequacies were uh, were identified so the lack of bus stop bypasses the answer to that was that this is an interim scheme now that's something to stop and think about that looks like a pretty good scheme doesn't it but that's an interim scheme until a real scheme is put in place. So the ambition here is, is really quite, uh, quite good. OK, so six months later, this was last week. Um, Debbie Watson, who's one of the, um, the people who's very active in Walk Ride, Greater Manchester, cycled down there uh, and did a video and said, isn't this fantastic? And it saved me seven pounds something in tram fares as well, uh, being able to go down there. Now, the thing is, look at the width of that. But look also, there is the Venos factory again, and there is no parking here anymore. That was all car parking all the way along there, and it's been removed. So just because people don't want their parking spaces to be taken away from them, their free storage of private goods, um, doesn't mean we shouldn't be able to do these sorts of things. And I had, couldn't resist putting meanwhile in Bolton, because this is, this is Manchester Road scheme. Um, as it currently stands, I don't think that's been painted any wider. Uh, I don't think that. Well, that, or that's after the after it was repainted wider. Um, it was originally painted too narrow. They've repainted it wider as uh, as a result of the measurements that I did, um, and uh, it just doesn't look very friendly at all. And part of the reason for that is because we've got right turn pockets and shading and uh, informal crossings instead of proper crossings. So it's not good for pedestrians either. Uh, so when we compare what Bolton is doing to what Trafford have already done and from consultation to implementation in six months, um, I think we really need to, uh, to, to look back at, um, at Trafford and see how they're, how, how they're achieving this. 
OK, the other thing I wanted to look at is just stepping away from specific schemes on the ground now, because we're going into our own transport planning. We've already looked at some other transport plans, and I think I highlighted Glasgow's transport plan uh, in a previous workshop. Um, I came across Birmingham's transport plan. Now, Birmingham have been steaming ahead with some really good stuff. And part of that is because of Adam Tranter becoming their uh, the uh, West, uh, West Midlands Walking and Cycling uh, Commissioner. Um, but or active travel commissioner rather, um, but um, but part of it is due to the fact that they've got this transport plan. Now this is not the active travel plan. This is the transport plan. So the vision is for sustainable, green, inclusive, go anywhere. So from anywhere to anywhere, safe and healthy environment, making active travel the first choice for people making short journeys. A lot of it is stuff that was in gear change five and a half years ago. Uh, not gear change that was in uh, made to move in greater manchester five and a half years ago um high quality public transport system for longer trips and the link into carbon uh, emissions and low um, low emissions now it's worth looking at how they've translated that into four key principles because the four key principles in their transport plan not their active travel plan their transport plan is reallocating road space to walking and cycling and public transport, transforming the city centre, and we'll have a quick look at, at each of these actually, prioritising active travel in local neighbourhoods, so you know, filtering out uh, through traffic and stuff like that, managing demand through parking measures. Now that's something that we've not really talked very much about, but um, it, it struck a chord with me because uh, Chris Paul from, Greg, from Manchester um, was talking about a pitch that he's putting to the DFT uh, in the next few days. Uh, to um, to look at using parking restrictions to reduce the amount of, um, of people uh, driving into city and town town and city centres. So looking at each one of those, they've got a slideshow, which is great. I mean, have a look at it because um, because it's uh, it's got some great stuff. Um, so five percent of all trips by cycling in 2023, and ten percent of all trips by 2033. Now that's just cycling, not walking and cycling. So, you know, that's part of that. That's quite an ambitious uh, target, but I think they'll probably get there because of looking at some of the things that they've done. 25% um, of all car journeys, that's just pointing out the existing information. That's not far different to, um, to, to, to Bolton actually. Bolton, I think if you look at the, um, the TFGM transport, uh, travel diary survey, then it is about 25% of all car journeys, car and van journeys, uh, are less than a mile. Uh, Shan will be able to correct me on that if I'm wrong. Hmm. Now, looking at the, the, the transforming the city centre, what they're modelling their actions on, and we've seen uh, this announced more recently, is what was done in Ghent in the Netherlands, where basically they divided the town there in Ghent, or the city in Birmingham, into areas, segments, and they will arrange things so that if you want to go from A to B by car and you're going from one sector to another, you have to go out and round and back in. So that's the sort of thing that they're talking about. And that's now in the Netherlands, that's that's quite a common practice. What it does is eliminates through traffic. It stops people driving through the centre. OK, next one was prioritising active travel in local neighbourhoods. So reduce the dominance of private cars school streets, um, walking and cycling short journeys, 20 miles per hour is the default speed limit for, well, we've actually got that in Bolton. We were, we're ahead of most people on that, actually. That was quite a good, um, a good move. Um, and car-free school streets. So that's all stuff that we, we know about, but they're really uh, steaming ahead of it, uh, ahead on it. And then the last one is worth looking at again, is uh, this managing of demand for private car use uh, by reducing the availability of parking. Now, somebody else mentioned to me, just as an aside the other day, that when councillors, when councils or houses authorities provide free parking on streets, um, that is actually, could actually be seen as unfair competition to commercial providers of parking, um, because it's actually a, a, a local government subsidy on uh, parking that's in competition to their multi-storey car parks or whatever. 
So that, that's an interesting point. But that's not what they've said here. But they've pointed out quite a number of benefits. And also they're talking about a workplace parking levy um, in, in, in Birmingham there. So this is this is it's all the sort of thing you'd expect to see in an active travel strategy. This is not an active travel strategy. This is the whole of their transport plan uh, that they're talking about here. So I thought that was worth uh, worth looking at. And I've given a link to um, to the strategy document uh, there um, so that you can have a look at that in more depth. And I think we should be looking at what a lot of other people are doing as we build our own transport strategy, because we might not agree with what they're doing, but at least we'll... Um, We'll see examples of what can be done. Now, very quickly looking at engagement, the one thing that uh, came to my notice on engagement, uh, it's come up a few times and uh, I didn't pay much attention to it, but it came up again last night in uh, one of the presentations in, um, in the Active Travel Cafe uh, online seminar series. Um, and this is something that the government produced about six months ago called the Wall of Beliefs, which is basically a recipe for how you deal with misinformation and disinformation and it really is very relevant to uh, to the engagement activities because one of the big problems that we have and we've seen that in in um, in proposals in Bolton as well as uh, other places is the backlash and the backlash is often based on on misinformation disinformation um, uh, and so on and so how you deal with that is really very difficult because if you challenge it directly uh, then that can actually backfire and make matters even worse. So what the wall of beliefs does is it tries to get to the root of why people are objecting. Rather than taking their objections one at a time, trying to get to the root of why they're objecting. What is it that they're thinking about? So a lot of cognitive psychology in here. And so is this to do with uh, just a belief that they've got from some recent fashion? Is it a belief that's derived from some norms like the ability to park your car on the streets is seen as almost as a human right uh, when, of course, it shouldn't be? Uh, or is it to do with uh, foundation beliefs, foundational beliefs or sacred beliefs, religion and, and, and so on? So that's one scale. And then the other scale is, does that belief cause harmful behavior? And we've seen in some cases that happening because um, where you've got um, modal filters and active neighborhoods or low traffic neighborhoods, as they're called elsewhere, um, you find people uh, setting fire to bollards and stuff like this and, and uh, doing some quite desperate things. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we're talking about in terms of harmful behavior. And then depending where the particular objection fits in relation to these two axes, what you do about that um, is dependent on that. So it's really worth looking at that if we're if we're really going to be serious about engaging on active travel uh, in Bolton Borough. Now, I'm not saying anything more about it because the, the document itself is really good. And I think, yeah, I put a link to it there. It's a government publication. And then the last thing I want to mention, it's still going uh, just it's uh, been bumbling around the, the five persons mark. Uh, for a while. I'm still hoping that by the time we get to two years, we might get into double figures again, uh, but I'm not sure about that. That was our most recent ride. And one of the, 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 the good things I can say about this is in all of those rides, we haven't yet been rained on. So that's something to, uh, to mention to people who say, oh, you can't cycle in Bolton because it rains all the time. Well, that's, tw that's um, the, the ni uh, 19 rides so far. Sorry, 21. Is it 21? It's a lot anyway, and we haven't yet been rained on. And the last one was fantastic. 